listening to the Small Town Queer podcast produced by Tweed Regional Museum in northern New South Wales, Australia. Follow us as we uncover and explore Tweed's rich queer history from the early 1900s to the present. The museum has collaborated with LGBTQIA community members to collect, share and preserve the histories of Tweed's many and varied queer voices. We wish to recognise the generations of local Aboriginal people of the Bundjalung Nation who are the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we are recording this podcast today. I'm Erica Taylor and I'm a curator of Small Town Queer and I'm here today with Emma Shield and I am a project coordinator for Small Town Queer. And today on the podcast we're talking to T Cozy, um, community historian about queering museums, galleries, libraries and archives. I think we'll cover them all. The glam, the glam sector. sector. Well, the glamour sector. <laughs> we're lucky to have such a good acronym, aren't we? Um, I thought we'd start by we're talking about how a small town queer came about. Um, it was probably 18 months ago. The museum got questioned as to what it held in its collection that told LGBTQIA plus people or stories in the Tweed. And it was very, very little, um, almost nothing. I think we, hold, we held one oral history and one photograph of a self-identified gay man. And that was it. And for a collection that's over 18,000 objects and over 50,000 photographs. It didn't represent those stories that we know are out there in the community. So off, off we went. Um, we were lucky enough to get government funding from Create New South Wales to help us with the project. Um, and Emma Shield came on board as co-curator and we started our journey. We did. And part of that journey very early on was meeting tea cozy and I don't know if you recall how this came about but you actually contacted me because I had seen an Australian gay and lesbian archive post on Facebook about the Northern Rivers Men's Network I think it was uh, a magazine or a newsletter so I reached out to Nick Henderson the archivist of ALGA who put me in contact with you and then I got this wonderful email from you and uh, all the work that you've already been doing in this space, which is really not a surprise. We actually touched upon this in a podcast I just recorded with T Cozy about how the community has already been working in this space to collect their stories in their voice. Yeah, I think that's the, you know, as we know, historically, um, people have been not represented in museums and collecting institutions. So it has been left to the community to collect their own history, which you've done, you know, Ian, and just taken the, such a big role and such an important role, <clears throat> particularly in a small town, collecting all of that history around Lismore and the Northern Rivers generally. So, yes, it was a great place to start, I think, mm, finding you. We were very lucky to meet you. Well, it was very exciting for me too. Um, I had coincidentally, before I had connection with the good folk of the Tweed Regional Museum, there's an annual homosexual history conference every year in a different capital city, and I'd been going for the last 10 years and presenting papers, and particularly about the work I've been doing in the Northern Rivers on queer history. And uh, some there was a, a particular person, Claire, who's a librarian in uh, Melbourne, who's on the Australian Lesbian Gay Archives, um, committee, uh, she said, look, I'm putting together a panel at the next conference in Melbourne and it's called Glamorising the Glam Sector, so looking at uh, how queer is the galleries, libraries, archives and um, museum sector. So I said, oh, OK, well, I might do a bit of research. So I ran around to the local historical societies, the libraries, uh, the galleries. Um, I didn't come to the Tweed Regional Museum actually, but anyway, I interviewed people at those various places to find out, you know, were they aware uh, that uh, there was a queer community? Had they engaged with that community? Had they told their stories or invited their artists to be involved? Um, 
And the story mostly was if somebody personally in one of those organisations had a connection with the queer community, they may have uh, been involved, but mostly they're not. And I mean, an example of one of the local historical societies, uh, which mostly has information about the pioneer story, really. Uh, so I went up there, chatted to the woman on duty that day, who was, you know, had some connection with the queer community through friends, and she said to me, but we don't have anything in our collection about your people. And I mean, that word, your people, is an interesting sort of term. Uh, but she said, just recently, one of our members, volunteers, is gay, and he's been putting together a file on the Tropical Fruits, which is a major queer organisation in in the, in the Northern Rivers uh, about what they're up to. So they've begun, they've just begun. But there was no policy, no awareness really. No. And I think when, when um, correct me if I'm wrong, when you first did connect with us physically and you came here, you did question, uh, particularly because we're funded by council, about what policies existed mm. in council and in the museum yeah. as one of the very first things. Yeah, because I think, I think I remember looking on the website actually after I talked to you and seeing did did the council in general have a diversity inclusion policy uh, and did the museum particularly or when I looked at the regional art gallery as well and I couldn't find anything really. Um, no, and then you have to question even if those policies exist. I mean, policies are only worth you know if they're followed and and used and embraced. Um, yeah. And that's, that's part of the project we went on to. I mean, the whole project wasn't just about collecting the history of the area. It was or about acquiring objects. No. No, or acquiring new things for mm. the collection. It was about really critically looking at the museum and our practices and our collection systems and our policies and making sure that everything was, you know, inclusive and we were representing the diverse people, you know, the history that was here. Mm. So it, I just thought it was a really, it was a, the first thing you picked up on and we went on to really embrace that, even just those questions, to really look and reflect about all of those things in our own organisation. I mean, yeah. if we propose to have to represent the diversity and showcase the diversity within our collection and really critique it, what kind of organisation are we? Mm. You know, are we an inclusive workspace? Are we well aware of the best practices to interpret and manage a collection that includes queer stories and objects? And what is our relationship like with the local community? Mm. I think we valued all of those objectives as an important part of this project. So beginning to build up a relationship Absolutely. Uh, as an ongoing pro part of the ongoing project. And I think that building of trust mm -hmm. is already part of the curation process, Erica, but I think it's particularly important when you're dealing with groups that are marginalised or have been traditionally mm -hmm. excluded. And it's tricky, as, as you've said before, because um, you don't, you know, you may have awareness of who's in the LGBTI community in the area, but until they come to you, you can't really approach them directly unless you have a personal contact uh, and say, OK, I know you're LGBTIQ uh, and we'd love to hear your stories. So that makes it quite a, a, a tricky thing. But, you know, you, what you've done here is create an exhibition online and, so, and the publicity around it. So hopefully that will draw people in. And we really couldn't have done that without the collaboration of people like yourself mm. and the, the queer community um, trusting us, giving us great advice, sharing their networks as well as their stories mm. and some of their objects with us. And that's really how word got out about this project because it was very important to us that the people that would participate were open with their identity uh, we didn't want to put anyone at risk or compromise anyone's safety. And we also really wanted to showcase the great achievement and leadership that already exists within this very diverse community of ours. Mm. And I think we found, I mean, especially with Emma's, Emma's research on the historical themes and the long-form articles that are on the website, you know, half of that you never would have found without these relationships mm. that we built or that you built, Emma, and that led you 
down the rabbit hole to further mm. information and, and further leads to put all all the research together. It, I don't think it could have been done without that foundation of building the relationship. And that's the thing. It might have just been someone saying to us, oh, we heard there was this restaurant down the road that used to have a gay-friendly night once mm. a month. And then Ian sent me mm. some articles from campaign magazine and then from there I was able to through our local network say do you know this person yep this person used to work there and then through them mm. we actually made contact with the owners and heard the real story behind that particular venue mm. or that event the human face mm. the human story mm. so the story was out there mm. uh, but it was not being uh Shared yeah, in, in and that was the thing, that, uh, really centering the voices of the queer community. Mm. They were telling us their stories. Mm. We weren't necessarily just reading articles and trying to put the pieces together. In some cases we had to do that because it was last century or the century before, but in most cases we were able to thankfully, through the queer community network, mm. find the people who mostly were very willing to tell their stories. Mm. And I remember coming first to visit you and I noticed a, a booklet called Caravans and Communes, which was an exhibition that you had some years back. And I, and I thought to myself, well, that's great. You know, this museum has embraced um, alternative uh, hippie culture that is part of this region. Um, but there's one story missing there and that's about a quite a unique and unusual hippie con alternative counterculture organisation, which was uh, Mandala, which in the Tweed and, and quite a unique um, story around uh, a gay commune uh, that right. wasn't in there at all. In that and the exhibition. very charismatic owner yeah. of that commune, And that's right, he was Johnson. a very public person yeah. and did a lot of uh, outreach into the community right. as a director and producer. The You Got Follies was part of his work, and the theatre stuff that he did. So, yes... It was a, yeah. It was a shame that story was missed out of that publication. But it goes it goes to show that that you know that thing things are missed, and it's all mm. dependent on the bias of the person of the museum professional putting it putting it together and mm. Mm. and resources too. I think and it, resources. It was very important yeah. that we had funding for yes. this yeah. for yeah. this project because there's lots of projects that need to be done, yeah. but we do need government support yeah. funding. One of the best reference books we found and we read was Queering the Museum by Nikki Sullivan and Craig Middleton, mm. which was only put out last year, 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Queering the Museum and it's um, it's about projects they have done and the idea of queering the museum or looking at museums and galleries through a queer lens um, but, I mean, there's so much more. It also broadened, you know, my curatorial practice to all kinds of lenses mm. in, in the work we do. Um, but from that, we broadened the project not just to looking about the history and finding it and writing the research, and, um, but also, you know, performing what, what's termed as querying the museum, which is this idea that, looking at our practices and our collections and as I said earlier we didn't you know we did we looked um, we did a survey of the collection using all kinds of search terms and and things and we didn't find in it just about anything but yet, but yet we know there's queer stories there because mm. you know statistics say yeah. some of those people in the 50,000 photographs are going to be LGBT um, and so we put on what's termed like a queer lens to look at our collection again, but through a queer lens. Go to the Small Town Queer website. Erica's written this fantastic article about this whole process. So Emma and I, I trolled the collection <laughs> once again. And we chose these certain photographs and objects that we thought, if they had no provenance, why can't they tell a queer story as well as they have told a heterosexual story? And two of those photographs um, are from the 1940s. I think it's post-war. One of them is a woman in trousers. They're black and white photographs. A woman in trousers uh, holding a heavy horse's lead. And the other one is a gypsy caravan, a very attractive gypsy caravan. And on the back of the photographs is written that this woman and another woman 
had travelled from Sydney by themselves in the caravan and stopped in Tweed Heads to seek um, some medical attention for the horse. And they liked it so much they stayed for five years. And I think it's easy to assume they were friends, mm. but really they're just, they were, you know, there's just as much chance they were right. together as a couple, a romantic couple living here all those years ago. Mm. And that those photographs are evidence of that with that mm. that queer lens. And, I mean, we found lots of other really great photographs um, that are up on the website. There's a lot that um, show men and women dressing in the uh, opposite gender. You know, it could be seen as a, a dress-up event or having a fun party and having a laugh, but with a queer lens, does it tell a different story? Is it, a gen- is it gender play? Is it individuals experimenting with their gender? I think it's also an important part of that queer, taking that queer lens is to extend that to members of the queer community. So one of Erica's great ideas was to invite members of the queer community that we've been collaborating with on this project to have a look at some of the objects Mm. that we've selected and interpret those objects or make a comment. And Tikozi, we asked you to to do that. Um, I think it was for the same photo that Erica has just described. That's right. I mean, you asked me to have a look at your objects that you'd picked out that stood out with your queer lens. Uh, and, you know, that one of the, the two women in the caravan um, really jumped out. And as, as you say, um, who knows? There's a lot of pressure to not um, name somebody as queer mm. because um, that could be dangerous. Well, yes. It could upset somebody. Uh, it could be seen as a slur even, you know. That's Whereas, right. you know, from my perspective as a queer man, as a gay man, uh, I think, wow, isn't that amazing that there's possibly a couple of lesbians wandering the street outside, in a, you know, together in a relationship and being quite public about it. And uh, so, you know, there we are. We're not invisible. Um, there's a little bit of our story. I don't see it as a slur, you know. We, you know I, I, I just see it as a, another expression of uh, sexuality and gender identity. And you don't even necessarily have to put a label on it. I mean, no. it's a queering is very much a process mm-hmm. as opposed to going around and stamping objects or story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Queer confirmed. <laughs> uh, so, And, you know, that photo we when we interviewed a local lesbian couple before Erica had even finished telling the story, they were like, oh, yeah, they're dykes, of course. They, of course they are. Yeah. That's their immediate assumption. Yeah. But within a lot of institutions there's this heteronormative assumption this Mm. centering of the heteronormative story Mm. first and sometimes only stopping there so there's another object that um, we queered which was uh, a scythe which is an agricultural tool used to chop the heads off weeds and Things like that, and a lot of people would be familiar with that as um, the object that the Grim Reaper holds. And uh, certainly, when I looked at that, the image or saw those sites within our collection, I immediately thought of the Grim Reaper in the AIDS ads, the Australian government AIDS ads in the early eighties, mid eighties, and what a terrifying image that was. Oh, yeah. Now for a lot of people, they might look at that and just say, oh, yeah, that's just an agricultural tool. or But maybe for a lot of other people, it immediately yeah, takes yeah, them to that to me, image. I look at it and I see yeah. it represents death and AIDS and a scary virus at the time and, and a very scary ad campaign. These are two really good examples uh, for people who might not be familiar with the process mm. of querying a museum or a collection or a library is to... Seek feedback from the community, invite the community to also evaluate and critique the objects mm. and the stories. But, yeah, reimagine those, mm. those mm. events and those stories. And particularly, you know, museums, we're so three-dimensional focused because we've got showcases and we need objects and 
how can we do a show on LGBTQIA people? We have nothing, mm. you know, mm. that we can find, but we can very easily display a site like that, which is, can be found in every regional museum mm. in Australia. And you can tell that, that story of the AIDS campaign and use that as a visual aid. Mm. And that's, that's a particularly great one of just being able to re-look at your collection to reinterpret objects in a different way to tell these stories mm. where you might not have anything to help you do that, mm. you know, at mm. the beginning. The, the idea is not limited to this is an object that was once owned by someone who identifies as LGBTQI plus or, mm. you know, that it could be an object that was owned by anybody. Mm. But the symbolism... Yep or the, um, the history attached to maybe that object being used in a different context is, is also important to tell. Mm. So it's probably a good, um, <clears throat> a good time to, well, to talk about. So the one thing, you know, the other thing we wanted to do was, was start collecting, focus collecting on for new objects that can help tell these stories. So... Mm. And already we've had some wonderful donations to the museum. Uh, we had a great, uh, the first novel from author, local author um, Jordan Clayton Lewis, which Black Horse Park, which came out in 2019, and he donated a copy of that, which will go into our collection. Uh, we've had vinyl records from queer performers in the mm -hmm. Tweed, um, great T-shirts that were worn during the marriage equality campaign. Um, we've just had wonderful pink taffeta and sequined dress donated by Mitchell Hull, his um, a local drag queen. And so we're really starting to build the collection now, mm. um, you know, and we will ongoing. And that's been a really great part of the project to watch, like, the collection grow mm -hmm. in that direction as well. Uh, if anyone's listening and they do have some objects they, <laughs> they think might be great, yes. please get in touch. <laughs> and we're also interested in people's stories as well too. Yeah. We Within the Small Town Queer website, there are a lot of people's individual stories, some wonderful people that have contributed stories and objects to the collection. But we also want to continue this project. It really is just the start of um, actively seeking the stories and histories of LGBTQIA plus people. So there is a link on our website where you can actually upload your story and image, uh, which will go into the collection and archive, or alternatively you can contact us um, through, the, through the museum's website. And can you do that, uh, tell that story anonymously if you choose? You can. Yeah. You can. Um, we... We, in the case of going through the website, you do have to give a name. Yeah. But if people are concerned about their safety or, or being public, they can contact myself or Erica mm. and we can, we can talk to them. It is difficult, though. We do prefer it if people... Um, talk about themselves and... What, what, I mean, this is a good question, Erica. Why is it important that when people contribute to a museum with their story or, or their objects, why is it important to, to be mindful that you do have a public profile? Yeah, so I guess... Or well, you are going to have one. You know, we're a public institution, so our collections and our archives are available for anyone to view um, yeah. and to use we collect on behalf of the community of the Tweed. And so those stories and objects um, should be able to be viewed and read by anyone. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't, we won't reject a story. No, no and we would never out name. someone. We'd no, be very we'd careful never not to do someone. that. Yep. Mm. Um, and there might be important stories that do need the protection of mm. anim anonymity. Um, but yeah, it adds to what we call provenance and authenticity of of the story they're trying to tell. So it's a grey kind of area. But and that, that sort of highlights the issue of, of the fact that queer stories have been invisible for so long. But, uh, there are still people who don't feel comfortable to tell their stories and uh, out themselves at the moment. Um, 
And, and that's where oral histories are really yeah. valuable because people can do an oral history and say, look, once I'm gone, then that's available to anybody. But of course, it's not available now. Yeah, we, we yeah we do have oral histories that are embargoed but till a date or mm. a date after death. That's that's always mm. an option, mm. um, and it does also talk. You know, collecting all these the objects and stories, we did have to have a critical look at what systems we use to collect and catalogue all this information. Yeah, it must be a new thing in a way. I mean, are there catalogue categories that that cover the queer stories? Yeah, well, I mean, looking at our um, database system, which is one that's used worldwide, it's a very big one, there's no, um, there's no possible way to record a person's pronoun, mm. um, which is obviously a problem, or sexual orientation. Which you know you traditionally might not record someone's sexual orientation, but when it becomes part of the significance of why you are acquiring something, mm. uh, you need to have the option to do that. So, you know, if your data collection methods aren't aren't even a safe place to collect someone's mm. data, then you've got a problem. So we're currently working through changing that um, and giving those options within the collection management system. Which is quite a huge thing to do, and mm. once it's done, will be available to museums worldwide who yeah, use wow. the same system. Um, and we've we've changed a few other little controls in our system that we could that allow us to, um, you know, record someone's gender beyond binary. Um, and so we looked at all those things and changed what we could, and putting steps in place to to change the rest of it. Um, we've also created a special classification called. A, Queer collection, yeah. and so objects acquired can be tagged with that, so it mm. makes them more findable by future researchers, yeah. which is really really handy. And then also overall, we're we're putting in steps to change our whole collection policy to really focus on the historic themes and contemporary themes that intersect with LGBTQIA people and stories. Well, as well as a whole um, spectrum of other kind of minority and traditionally oppressed groups of people. Um, and it's not easy to change a collection policy. It has to go all the way up to a council meeting and be ratified by mm. council. <laughs> and uh, we'll get that done early next year. So that's that's been really good as well. Yeah. And then I think all of that, you know, this is all part of clearing the museum. And it's even to take a look at our forms, the museum's oh, forms yeah, and yeah. surveys. Uh -huh. I mean, as you know, you both know, it's just that simple thing. Is someone able to identify themselves how they would like to on on your general day paperwork? That right. Do all the time? When is it relevant? When is it not relevant? Yeah, yeah. Is it even relevant? Not everyone uh, is comfortable with the word mm. queer. Uh, gender and sexuality don't always intersect. No, yeah. So. Uh, it is a reimagining that needs to happen at a lot of different levels of public institutions mm -hmm. and government. Um, a lot of it is beyond the scope of this project, but I think by us re critiquing our internal systems within the museum and revisiting the collection management processes and the policies, I feel like we've set... Uh, council on somewhat of a path they're definitely interested because they've had to read yeah about the exhibition they've had to read about the, the well the new collection policy in order to ratify it and that's involved introducing volunteers and co-workers to new language mm. terminology i mean you know, there must be myriad standards of practice. council forms that don't even give an option right. for oh, gender yes. and male and female yes. for ourselves we also had to unlearn mm. a lot of things there was a lot of education involved which is why the queering museum is a great book to refer to and we were fortunate enough to have training provided by ACON. So all the staff undertook yeah. awareness training, which is a wonderful program I'd recommend to... Our volunteers as well, did it? Our volunteers. Oh, yeah. um, we know there are people in management and council that are also looking to potentially take that training as well. So that's training about um, LBGTI community. That's right. That's right. Of, that's yeah. right. It's 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 awareness training. So it it does it introduces mm. you to individual people's stories, mm. 
their, you know, the different categories of identification, um, even just basic common sense and courtesy when liaising with people and describing them in documents. And that's what I think, I mean, if there's any other small museums are listening to this podcast, like there's such a host of simple basic things that aren't that hard to do. Um, you know, the forms and surveys and language are one. The APON training is so affordable and online, accessible to everyone. And we also did the ACON Welcome Here project, mm-hmm. which is a simple um, online form. And then the ACON will provide you with visual stickers for your building that says everyone's welcome here. Mm. Because we know from our training that it can be something that simple as a rainbow sticker mm. that can make um, LGBT people feel welcome mm. in, a, in a place. But back, back to the, you know, council does have a um, access and diversity policy. But I like how this project intersects is kind of says to council, hey, let's just not have a policy. Let's actually be inclusive and diverse mm-hmm. and do projects that are. And so hopefully that's what they take from I it. think I hope so. I mean, this project, we've worked, I mean, Ian, you're one of our main collaborators, but there's somewhere between 25 and 30 people from the LGBTQI community Mm -hmm. that have worked with us on this project. Everything from providing us feedback about their impression of the museum prior to being involved in the project to their experience of working with us to looking at our objects, querying our collection and sharing their stories, Mm. trusting us to be uh, the carriage of their stories online but also to be handled and managed correctly and respectfully within the collection. At uh, the Melbourne Homosexual History Conference a couple of years ago, there was this forum uh, where a number of people, uh, myself a community historian in a regional area, some people from uh, Capital City Museums and State Libraries and uh, people from Archives, and they talked about how their institution or their organisation or their space um, was querying itself, was aware of how queer it was, was Mm glamorising, we use the term, glamorising itself to be much more inclusive Mm -hmm. and uh, aware of uh, their collection, methods and their displays and their cataloguing and and everything Mm. to help them become uh, more in touch with the stories and the lives of LGBTIQ people. So it was a very interesting forum really and and, and there was a lot of um, positive uh, stories and uh, lots and lots of organisations that I remember seemed to be on that path, uh, whether it was the Immigration Museum in St Adelaide or the the, the, the uh, Melbourne City Library, for instance, having exhibitions about gay liberation. And uh, in terms of the area that, uh, I mean, I, I checked some of the organisations and galleries and spaces in the Northern Rivers and, uh, and, and made a list and found that there were, you know, a number of exhibitions and activities, you know, such as me putting on an exhibition at the Southern Cross Library Learning Centre in Lismore, uh, where they'd, they'd uh, actually had, I realised when I talked to them, they'd already had two exhibitions. One featured a famous local drag queen, you know, Maud Boat, uh, and they'd also done another uh, exhibition about an, an artist who was not specifically just queer, mm-hmm. but uh, that was part of the story. Which may have not been recognised in the past. That's right, that's right. They, they, when talking to them, they didn't really have a policy to make sure that they included a diverse mm. uh, stories in their exhibition space, but in fact they had. It sort of helped them in a way to uh, make it more a, a project um, in the future. And I guess a lot of the representatives of those institutions must have been listening at that glamorising presentation of Forum because it seems quite a pivotal moment because now we're seeing a lot of Australian, both uh, city and regional public and cultural institutions doing queer-themed or queer-representative exhibitions. 
uh, oral history projects and the yeah. like. Yeah, and I mean, I, I'm aware that, uh, for instance, the, the I think, it, I'm not sure if it's a gallery or museum or both in Wagga Wagga, they uh, did an exhibition a couple of years ago on the queer I think that uh, was museum the museum of the Riverina. Riverina, yeah. that's right. So, and I just read recently that the West Shane Museum in Perth uh, has just announced that they have a full project to queer themselves and to yeah. uh, offer more information and more stories and uh, engage more with the LGBTIQ community. So and that's, I think, yeah. a really key word is engage, mm. is to not just take the stories and mm. package them and display them. You really have to include the community mm. and have the community's voices very much in the centre and heard as part of that exhibition. Otherwise, you can very much run the risk of ignoring an important part of someone's life yes. or their identity. And I think that's where, it's, you know, the small, in our small town, mm. we are like regional places and museums, we have such a different relationship with our local community like it's more intimate mm -hmm. people can walk through our door and we see them whereas in a big you know I've worked in big national museums where you don't see the public as a curator you might go years without seeing any mm -hmm. member of the public at all so that's what we really tried to dig into in our project was the, the small town difference mm. Mm. And it's digital too, which I yeah. think is innovative, yeah. um, probably came at the right time given that we are going through COVID, but it also meant that we got quite immediate feedback from the community, yeah. which I was very much sweating about <laughs> and also when we first launched because yeah. yeah. I thought if we don't, if the, you know, I talk about the community as this monolith, but really if, if people and important organisations within the LGBTQI community uh, don't receive the exhibition well, I was very worried. Yes. Yeah. The the feedback has been really positive because I would hope it's a it's a project of the community, mm. about the community, but also of the community. Yeah. Mm. With the community. And it also being online can reach a much broader audience than just That's the, true. You know, and a lot of the people that have given me feedback have also said things like, um, I thought I was really the only lesbian or I was the only gay in the village. They mm. really did say that to yeah. me and repeat that back to me yeah. and was yeah. really happy to know that there was a history but also that mm. there is a lot of people within the community doing great things, yeah, trying yeah. to organise yeah. social yeah. activities mm. as well as advocate and that less sort of not feeling so isolated mm. which is obviously a theme that um, will always come up in a, a small town or mm. regional themed exhibition so that's been great feedback mm. to hear that people are proud of where they come from or where mm. they've chosen to live or they have a greater sense of pride but also maybe feel a little less isolated than they might have and it's been great being you know particularly digital making it's made us so easy to pivot and react to feedback. I mean, I know on the first day or so, someone in the community noticed something we'd said that wasn't quite correct and we're able to just, we're, you know, we're listening. It just mm. really listen. And look, I think we should, we should be really transparent and say yeah. what that was. So in the about section of our website, we um, sort of state the objectives and one of them is to recognise self-determined identities, genders, respect that, use that, and then we go on to say by using preferred pronouns. Mm. And uh, a wonderful member of the community contacted us immediately and said, it's pronouns, it's not a choice, it's not preferred, just say pronouns, and said that in the nicest, respectful, mm. polite way, and we're like, of course, of course, but mm. neither of us are trans. Mm. Not no. that that's an excuse, but we, no. you know, no. we it, were ignorant of that and we fixed it immediately. Well, I don't yeah. think we're ignorant of it. I think we knew, we knew that our problem was, you know, the telling thing is we'd written that about section true. at the start of the project. Yeah. That's true. And so That's a good it's point. It's kind of like proof, you know, it was our learning journey, mm -hmm. that whole yeah, whole really. situation. It was still there from the start but, we'd, you know, evolved and grown by the end of it. But it does show, you know, we, we, we feel like we're so open to listening to feedback and criticism mm. and and all of those things and, you know, I think all museums should be really mm. it's and not be afraid of it at all. And it's yeah. fantastic that you can respond immediately. Absolutely. 
and you know we do uh, we should add we do have a very a great director Judy Keane who's who's been our director through the project and it has involved actually the whole team mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. um, in education and and learning and we've thrown things around the office and we've debated the smallest things for mm. days mm. and days and it's really been a whole team mm. team effort and it was always about making it right and respectful mm. um we were never questioning people's identities or the authenticity of who that it was, it was you know we're so beyond that now mm, yeah. really it's about making sure that those categories those descriptors the language that we use is correct, respectful, all of those things, but cool. also something that hopefully in the future, 50 years down the line, people can be searching our archive and it's not going to be so hard to find these stories mm -hmm. um, because, as Erica pointed out, within our collection it was very difficult and then to go outside of the collection and use things like Trove, we had to use a lot of... Um, Awful words yeah, that yeah. we used to explain, or people were pathologized, or mm. the legal language, you know, really mm. awful. Criminal language. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And mm. you would have to use those kind of words in mm. order to find the stories mm. of LGBTQI plus people. And that's our commitment, I think, to, you know, the whole tree community going forward is to let's not, this can't happen again. Mm. No. We can't. We can't just do this project and step away. It's it's really integrating museum collection and practices that's going to ensure it doesn't happen again. Well, thank you so much, Ian T. Cozy Gray, for your <laughs> contribution. Um, we couldn't have done it without you. You already created these spaces, these groups. You were making this history long before Erica and I. That's even right. imagine this project uh -huh. mm. uh you've already been doing the work as we've already pointed out in the podcast that we did with you earlier that i would encourage listeners to go and listen to uh people like yourself within the community have already been collecting stories and creating archives and we're really grateful to you and the australian gay and lesbian archive for opening up your collections and archives and stories and lending us uh, your expertise and sharing your networks with us because it's made for the richer mm. of a project. And you were there. Mm. You saw a lot of these stories. I was there. You were there. <laughs> you could tell the story. And we really appreciate uh, your remember. involvement in this project. And we um, certainly look forward to continuing working with you and the members of the community that have been involved in Small Town Queer. Oh, and I think, you know, your project is an, hopefully an inspiration to other museums, particularly regional museums. That's what we were saying on an Australia. interview. Yeah, we hope yeah. to just, if we yeah. all just have this patchwork quilt approach to mm. queer history, then mm. the idea is that one day it all joins up and mm. in the smaller regions and mm -hmm. it's found. Thank you for listening to the Small Town Queer podcast. To hear more Small Town Queer stories, subscribe to the series and like, share and review this episode. And check out the Small Town Queer playlist on Spotify, curated by museum staff and project participants. For more information about Small Town Queer, visit museum.tweed.newsouthwales.gov.au forward slash small hyphen town hyphen queer. Tweed Regional Museum is supported by the New South Wales Government through Create Funding New South Wales. This project would not have been possible without the support and collaboration of the people of Tweed who have generously shared their lived experiences, archives and objects with this project. <laughs>